Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. If you're looking for good real world content on Snowflake, then you're definitely in the right place. When I started using Snowflake back in 2017, one of my biggest frustrations was getting hold of good practical content that I could use to help me design and implement and work with Snowflake. So I'm really hoping these videos I produce help you as well. Uh, this video is a second of a two part series on data loading in Snowflake. And the first one I, co I covered staging, stages areas, file formats, and the copy into command. And if you missed that, you can click the pop-up banner here and take a look at that. So I definitely recommend that. And in this video, in part two, I'm going to cover the file preparation, semi-structured data, using dedicated virtual warehouses, and partitioning stage data. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do that. And um, click the bell icon as well to be notified. I'm releasing new videos every single week. And also, if you if you got any feedback or any comments, or if you want to see content on specific parts of Snowflake, then please drop a, a note in the comments. OK, guys, so let's get into part two of data movement in Snowflake. And let's start off talking about file preparation. So you'll want to take advantage of Snowflake's ability to load data in parallel. It's really important to consider the size of the data files to be loaded. So they shouldn't be too large nor too small. Snowflake recommends you should aim to produce files of around 100 to 250 megabytes compressed. This might force you to consider splitting larger files into smaller ones or grouping together several small files into one larger one. In one project we worked on, we needed to migrate a lot of historical data from a legacy on-premise data warehouse to Snowflake. So to do this, we used our ETL tool to extract data into monthly increments before we wrote the data out into multiple CSV files. We push those files files into the cloud storage area. In this case, we were using the external stage approach that we discussed in part one. We were then able to load those files in parallel into one target table. So the number and capacity of servers in a virtual warehouse also influences how many files you can load in parallel. So it definitely pays off to spend some time to run some tests and find the right balance that works for you in your environment. When working with CSV files or any delimited text files for that matter, I also found that it was useful to standardize some of the data before loading the data into Snowflake. Where possible, try to encode the file in UTF-8 format, which is the default character set in Snowflake. In one project, there were carriage returns and some of our source data, and that was introduced from free text fields being allowed within the front end application with uh, little to no validation. So we also needed to replace those carriage returns and take those out of the, of the files before we load them into Snowflake, um, otherwise it would break our CSV format. We also chose to escape any single or double quotes sitting within the data, as well as selecting a unique delimiter character just to be extra sure that we, it wasn't going to cause us any issues. But you definitely need to spend some time uh, just assessing the data quality that you get, and especially if it's from a legacy front end system with little or no validation. And if you're going to be working with CSV file formats as well, well worth the time up front to, to look at that. Moving on to semi structured data. So when you load any semi structured data into Snowflake, it'll be stored within a variant data type column in the target table. Snowflake will attempt to treat the semi-structured data in the same way as relational data behind the scenes. So it'll try to compress it and store the data into a columnar format um, to, to try to optimize that and give you the best performance. However, not every single element is extracted into this format. There are some exceptions, and one of the most notable ones is the handle of null values. When a null value in semi-structured data is encountered, Snowflake doesn't extract this into the columnar format. The reason for this is because the optimizer can't distinguish between a SQL null value and an element within a semi-structured uh, data type, such as JSON, which also contains the value null. So due to this fact, the data cannot be stored in the same optimized way, and that results as a, in a price to pay, and that price is performance. If Snowflake can't find the extracted element it needs within the columnar format, then it has to go back and scan the entire JSON structure, for example, to find the values. So there's a couple of things you can do to avoid that. If you definitely need to preserve the null value, so it's actually providing some valuable information, then it could be an idea to extract those into a relational format before you load the data into Snowflake. Lotus creates additional upfront work to create that relational structure. The performance gains when querying the data time and time again might be worth it. So you take that one off hit up front to split that into a relational format. You load it into Snowflake once, but then if you're querying it several times, you'll get the performance payoff over time. You'll have to obviously make your own assessment when considering how often that data is going to be queried. Alternatively, if the, if the null values don't provide 
any additional information or, or business context and you can set the strip null value set into true in the file format. Just want to pause before I continue just to mention that I've got a Udemy course on uh, Snowflake practice questions. Uh, it's, it's based on the Snow Pro course certified exam. If you're looking to, to do that in the near future, and I'd, I'd really recommend it if you're looking to increase your um, experience of Snowflake, that's definitely going to form and help part of your preparation for the exam. If you don't follow me uh, on LinkedIn already, please look me up and uh, and connect for, for all the latest updates. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please uh, like and subscribe because I'm producing videos like this every week. Let's move on to talk about dedicated data virtual warehouses in Snowflake. So when loading data into Snowflake, a key concept to understand is how you can use dedicated virtual warehouses to present prevent contention. So you might have had experiences previously when a user executes a, a really big query before going home for the evening and the query continues to run through the night and ends up locking tables, preventing your ETL process from running. Of course, there's measures you could have taken in that scenario to prevent it from occurring, but I'm just using this as an example really to illustrate that the design of Snowflake is different and by, by its very nature, you can avoid running into similar issues. So it's common to have dedicated virtual warehouses which supply the resources for your data pipelines and bulk data loads and you can kind of isolate the resources required for that and keep them separate. So that ensures that the correct amount of resources is available at the right time to allow for efficient loading on, of uh, data on the Snowflake and it removes any contention with other, other processes. Just a high level example is something similar to this. So when you're configuring multiple dedicated warehouses, they may line up with different business groups, departments or applications, and that protects all those different processes competing and fighting for the same resources. Let's just talk briefly now about partition stage data uh, within an external stage. So you can separate the data into a logical structure within AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Containers using file paths. Partitioning the data in this way not, not only makes it easier to locate the files in the feature, but it's also important for performance purposes in creating a structure which includes source system name or application name, along with the date the date was written should be considered as a minimum requirement. You should also maybe think about more granular levels of partitioning when it comes to date. So for example, a common approach would be to use year, month, day, which can be broken down even further to hour or even 15 minute increments, for example. The choice you make will be based upon how many files your uh, solution generates over a certain time period. But the ultimate goal here is to reduce the number of files sitting in each directory as the copy statement when executed in Snowflake will try to read a directory list which is presented to it by the cloud storage area. So you want to try and keep it as, as narrow as you can. As you load data into Snowflake using the copy into command, metadata is automatically tracked and stored for 64 days. So this includes several fields for each data file loaded, such as the name of the file, the file size, and the number of rows in the file. This metadata is also very useful for understanding what files were loaded when, but it also prevents the same data from loading more than once. In certain environments, you may have limited control over the data files being delivered to you. So in those cases, you may not always be able to guarantee the data files on archived after you've loaded them. Also, there could be occasions where the same files are mistakenly delivered to the staging area again. In those instances, you don't need to worry about writing defensive code to check for this, because if you've loaded the file in, in the previous 64 days into Snowflake, the copy and two command will simply ignore it and skip over that particular file. You can override that behavior, of course, and that can be really useful for testing. So imagine you want to reload the same file again and again to test an end-to-end -end process. In that case, you can use the force copy option to override this default behavior in Snowflake. Finally, I just want to mention I've got a new book coming out soon, Building Solutions of Snowflakes, probably going to be early next year. I hope you really find these videos useful. And don't forget to like and subscribe and drop a comment on any of the topics you'd like to see me cover in the future.